covered up by mercy's hand. A bed of beauty where you stand. Again tonight, it's mocking. Okay. And the band. It's a good prayer to begin. Study tonight, shall we? Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to gather around your word and study it tonight. Thank you for the people who have come to attend tonight. And Romans is, he opens up the word to us. Maybe we may we have open minds and open hearts to 
absorb what he has to share with us tonight, as well as to... Testing. One, two, three. Can y'all hear me all right? <clears throat> yes, I can. Type the letter Y if you can. You're such a low run. All right, well, we're going to get this show on the road. Violinist, would you open with prayer for us, brother? The floor is yours. He did. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity we have to gather around your word and study it tonight. And also, thank you for the people who are attending tonight, and may they be enriched spiritually as well. May we have open minds and open hearts to really absorb what you would have to tell us. May we also make a point of it, of not just hearing it, but actually doing it, putting it into practice. Thank you for Romans as well, and his study is prepared for us, as he has each week. And then I pray, amen. And amen. Thank you, Violinus, for that. <clears throat> well, it's good to see you all here. The house is uh, really nice and full tonight. That's good. We all know the drill. This is a discussion and not a lecture. Please feel free to contribute ideas, comments, insights, reflections, relevant scriptures, and questions, but hold those questions to the end because... I am a sucker for rabbit trails, and I will get to your questions at the end. There they are now. Well, thank you, violinist. Uh, I'll get to your questions at the end, but uh, i got a lot to cover, so I'd like to do that. So, having said all that, let us begin, shall we? <clears throat> we are continuing in our current series, What is a Christian? Last week, we completed our review and examination of our being children of God. And at the end of last week's discussion, we saw the introduction of the new facet <clears throat> of faith that we will turn our, now turn our attention to. Faith was introduced into the discussion in Galatians 3, verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. And last week we saw that faith is a gift and <clears throat> that Jesus is the author of it. So how are we going to approach faith? First, we need to come to grips with a very crucial verse that speaks of the place that faith should have in our lives as believers. We read in Hebrews 11.6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. <clears throat> and my first commentator tonight is one of my favorite. I hope he's one of yours. Of this, Alexander McLaren writes, Seeking God. Peter has been pointing to the patriarch Enoch, the second of these examples of the power of faith in the Old Covenant. <clears throat> and, of course, this is taken from Hebrews 11, which is listed or referred to by scholars as the listing of the heroes of faith, Old Testament. And Alexander McLaren points out that Enoch was the second person listed as one of those heroes of faith. It occurs to him that there is nothing said in Genesis about Enoch's faith, so he set about showing that he must have had faith because he walked with God and pleased them. And so if it's impossible, <clears throat> as we just read, to please God without faith, then surely Enoch must have, faith, must have had faith. And I think that's a reasonable draw there. 
that no man could thus walk with God and please him unless he had come to him, and no man could come to a God in whom he did not believe, and whom he did not believe to be waiting to help and bless him when he did come. So the facts of Enoch's life shows that there must have been in him <clears throat> an underlying faith. Sometimes uh, scripture teaches us things in not so many words. And we have to be careful when we connect some of those dots because there have been many, many, many dots connected that were not related and that have led people to very wrong conclusions and very wrong doctrines and very wrong understandings and practices. So while the, while the Bible <clears throat> is open to having its dots connected, the result or the conclusion of those connections should agree with all of the direct statements, with all of the direct uh, um, doctrines that are clearly spelled out. And this is an example of a correct, I think, connecting of the dots. If it's impossible with fit, without faith to please God, and we read that Enoch pleased him, then it's not an assumption to say that he had faith, because it goes in line with this direct statement in Hebrews eleven six. <clears throat> so let's continue. That's all I need to say about the context of the words before us. And I'm not going to speak of the writer's argument, but only of this one aspect of the divine character, which is brought out here. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now, a word about the seeking. Seek. Do we need to seek? Not in the way in which people go in quest of a thing that they've lost and do not know where to find. We do not need to search. <coughs> we do not need to seek, at least not in that same way. And Butler writes, Lord, help us to diligently seek you, O Lord. And I'll say amen to that, uh, Butler. beginning of our seeking is that God has sought us in Jesus Christ and so we have done forever with oh that I knew where I might find him we have done forever with feeling after him if happily we might find him that's all past we have to seek but let's never forget we must have been found of him before he as Jesus said in, in John six forty four. No man can come to me except the Spirit of the Father draw him. So that's why we read here. Let's never forget that we must be found, have been found, past tense of him, before we seek him. And here again, this is a connecting of dots where, where uh, it's not specifically <clears throat> stated in so many words, but it is in agreement with those things that are clearly said. That is to say, he must have revealed himself to us in the fullness and reality and solid certainty of his existence and character before there can be kindled in any heart or mind the desire to possess him. As John writes, we, we love him, but he loved us first. And so he must have flashed his light upon the eye before the eye beholds and he must have stimulated the desire by the revelation of himself which comes before all desires ere any of us will stir ourselves up to lay hold upon God <clears> there <throat> is not to be a doubtful search but a certain, <coughs> but a certain seeking that goes straight to the place where it knows that its treasure is. 
Just as a migratory bird will set out from the foggy and ice-brown shores of the north and go straight to the mists and the night over continents and oceans to a place where it never was before, but to which, but to which it was led. God only knows how, by some deep instinct, too deep to be an error, and too persistent not to find its resting place. That is how we are to seek. <clears throat> or to seek as the flower turns its opening petals to the sunshine, making no mistake as to the quarter of the heaven in which the radiance is lodged. We have to seek as the rootlet goes straight down to the river, knowing where the water is, from which life and sap will come. Thus we have to seek where and what we know. Our quest is no doubtful and miserable hunting for a possible good, but an earnest desire for a certain and solid blessing. That is the seeking. <clears throat> And Butler writes from Ephesians 2, 5, He made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions, and it is by grace that you have been saved. Excellent addition there. Uh, Butler, thank you. <coughs> Continuing, let us put it into two or three plain words. The prime requisite of the Christian seeking after God is as the writer here says faith I need not dwell upon that must believe that he is yes of course we do not seek after negation or hypotheses we seek after a living being and that he and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him or as, as, as God said in the Old Testament if you serve for me with your whole heart I will be found of you so it is a diligent seeking yes we were not sure that we should find what we wanted we should never go to look for it beyond all that Let me put three things as included in and necessary to the Christian seeking. Desire, effort, and prayer. We seek what we desire, but too many of us do not wish God and and would not know what to do with him if we had him, and would be very much embarrassed if it were possible for the full blessing which come along with him to be entrusted to our slack hands and unloving hearts. We call ourselves Christian, Christians. Let's be honest with ourselves and rigid in the investigation of the thoughts of our own hearts. Is there a wish for God there? Is there an aching void in his absence? Or do we shovel cartloads of earthly rubbish into our hearts and thus desires that can be satisfied only with him rather and thus dull the desires that can be satisfied only with him? These are not quite which anyone has a right to expect an answer from another. They're not questions that any Christian can, any Christian man or woman can safely shirk answering to himself and to God. The measure of our seeking is actually settled by the measure of our desire. There's an exact uh, correspondence there between the two. <clears throat> Then effort, of course, follows desire, as surely as the shadow comes from the substance, because 
the only purpose of our desires in the constitution of our nature is to supply the driving power for effort. They are in the steam and they are the steam in the boiler intended to on the wheels. And so for a man to desire a thing but he can do nothing whatever to bring about is misery and folly. <clears throat> But for a man to desire and not to work towards fulfilling his desire is greater misery and greater stupidity. One cannot believe in the genuineness of those devout aspirations that one's hearts, that one hears in people's prayers, get up and wipe the dust off their knees and go out into the world and do nothing to bring about the fulfillment of their prayers. <clears throat> A great deal of that desire amongst Christians in all churches, conventional utterances which are backed up and verified by no corresponding conduct. If we're seeking after God, we shall not let all the seeking effervescence in pious aspirations. And, and Butler writes from James 4.17, To him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. And, and Butler, I think that is an excellent application of that verse. Because if we're praying fervently for something to happen, then, <clears throat> well, the best way I could put it, is is this is not scriptural but i think it has scriptural merit i heard this in a sermon once where the man where the minister said we need to pray as if the thing we're praying for is all in god's hands to do and then we need to act following that prayer as if it's all on us that we have to do it there has to be a correspondence of activity and behavior in conjunction with the things we're praying. It's not a matter of faithlessness that we're working as if God can't or won't do it. It certainly has to be activity on our part. <clears throat> it will get consolidated. Butler writes, I must go to the next level. Absolutely. It will get consolidated into corresponding action and operate to keep thought and love directed towards him, even amidst the trivialities and legitimate duties and great things of life. <clears throat> there are going to be roadblocks in our way, the things that we have to go around, things that we have to go over and under and through. But our goal, our eyes should always be on that goal. both in prayer and personal activity. There will be effort to bring him into connection with all our work, effort to keep him as we go about our daily tasks. If we are truly seeking after God, Then desire and effort being presupposed, they're the prerequisites, there will come honest prayers, genuine prayers. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found, says the prophet, and immediately goes on to exhort us to call upon him while he is near, as one in the chief way of seeking him. <clears throat> He is always near, closer to us than friends and lovers, closer to us than our eyes and hands, near in his Son and the Spirit, near to hear and to bless, near and desiring to be nearer, yea, to be blended with our being and to dwell in us and we in him. We have not only to desire his gift and to work towards it, 
but to ask for it. <coughs> Then, if we exercise these three activities of desire, effort, and petition, we may truly say, When thou saidst, Seek ye my face, my heart also said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. And may go on, as the psalmist did, to offer the consequent prayer, Hide not thy face from me, in full assurance that he is found by every seeking soul, so much for the seeking. <clears throat> That's just the introduction explanation. He goes on now to say, now a word about the diligence <coughs> in seeking. The writer uses a very strong expression. One word in the original, which here is adequately rendered, them that diligently seek him. Half-hearted seeking finds nothing. You sometimes say to your children, when you have set them to look for anything and they come back and say they've not been able to <laughs> you do not know how to seek. <clears throat> and Butler writes, we know deep down if we are truly seeking Christ dil diligently. Oh yes, that is absolutely true. There is half-hearted seeking, there is lip service seeking, but we do know deep down if we're truly seeking Christ. <clears throat> and Dawn says, we do, but others may not know. Well, I agree with that, Dawn. I think that sometimes when somebody is half-hearted about something and is just paying it lip service, I mean, there are good actors, but sometimes that insincerity and that lack of diligence does... <clears throat> does it expose itself? And so, adding to what he just said to the child who said they couldn't find something, that you do not know how, how to seek, he says, and that is true about a great many of us. Half and half desire so that one eye is turned on earth and the other eye lifted up now and then to heaven does not bring us much. It will bring a little, but not the fullness of the blessing which follows on wholehearted, continuous, persevering seeking. <clears throat> if you hold a cup below a tap in an unsteady hand, sometimes it's under the whole rush of the water, and sometimes it's on the one side, and it will be a long time before you get it filled. <clears throat> there will be much of the water spilled God pours himself upon us and we hold our vessels with unsteady hands and twitch them away sometimes and the bright blessing falls on the ground and cannot be gathered up and our cup is empty and our lips arched interrupted seeking will find little Perfunctory seeking will find less. <clears throat> and Butler writes, God expects we, we come after him with our all. And that's exactly correct. Conventional religion brings very little blessing, very little consciousness of the presence of God and that is why so many who call themselves Christians and are so in a measure and in a sense know so little of the joy of being found of God. They have sought, but not sought diligently, <clears throat> which this verse tells us to do. Now let us take the rebuke to ourselves if we need it. And we all need it, more or less. Very threadbare piece of Christian counsel to be earnest in our seeking after God. But it is nonetheless needed because it is threadbare. And it would not be threadbare if it had not been so much needed. They that search diligently 
which is the real meaning of the words in the book of Proverbs rendered that they seek me early shall find me. <clears throat> and violinist writes, I feel like this teaching is directed straight at me. But guess what, Viol uh, or rather Butler said that. But guess what, Butler? This is really to all of us. I may be speaking it, but I am only hearing it as well and need to hear it. <clears throat> So we have the, the seeking, the diligence in the seeking, and now Alexander McLaren goes to point three. Me to the last thing, the reward and word. He, God, is the reward of them that diligently seek Him. Word of seeking is the thing that you're looking for. So the best reward that God, the rewarder, gives is when he gives himself. There are a great many of other good things that come to the diligently seeking Christian soul. But the best thing is that God draws near. Violinist writes, your studies are timeless. Well, that's because I'm, I'm yielding to and deferring to very gifted writers or writing timeless messages and commentaries based on a timeless book. <laughs> Enoch sought God, came to God, and so he walked with God. The reward of his coming was continuous calm communion which gave him a companion in solitude and one to walk at his side all through the darkness and the roughness as well as the joys and smoothness of daily life. <clears throat> um, there is no reward comparable to the felt presence in our own quiet hearts of the God who has found us and whom we have found. If we have that, then he becomes here and now the reward of the diligent search and the reward of it too. They carry in itself the assurance of the perfect reward of the coming time. He walked with God and God took him. That will be true of all of us. <clears throat> There's only one to see life that is sure to result in the finding of what we seek. All other search, the quest after the chief good, if it runs in any other direction, is resultless and barren. But there is one course, and only one, in which the result is solid and certain. I have never said to any of the seed of Jacob, Seek ye my face in vain. If we seek him, or rather if, if we seek, he will be found of us, and so, um, and so be our rewarder and our reward. <clears throat> Unquote from Alexander McLaren. So I now see this an independent principal part of our walk with God in seeking him because we because we know that he is and is a rewarder. I'd like to try to answer the next question. What is faith? We see the activities of faith, the seeking, the diligence, the prayer, the belief that God is there. But what is faith itself, if it's such an intrinsic part of a Christian's life that we cannot please God without it, <clears throat> can we know what is faith? Unlike most biblical terms where, where faith is concerned, the Bible provides what can be arguably regarded as a definition. And it's found in, in the book of Hebrews still, in, verses 11, in chapter 11, verses 1 to 3. Now, faith is the substance of the things hoped for, 
the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good report, and that through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen are not made of things which do appear. <clears throat> so verse 3 swing, swings right back to verse 1, that faith is the substance of things hoped for, but the evidence of things not seen. Now let's look into the Expositor's Bible for a deeper explanation. Faith is an assurance and a proof. It is often said that one of the greatest difficulties in the epistle to the Hebrews is to discover any real connection of ideas between the author's general purpose in the previous discussion and the splendid record of faith in the 11th chapter. <clears throat> Rhetorical connection is easy to trace. His utterances throughout have been incentives to confidence. Let us hold fast our confession. Let us draw near with boldness unto the throne of grace. Show diligence unto the full assurance of hope. Cast not away thy bo your boldness. These exhortations would sufficiently describe the, 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 the apostle's practical aim from the beginning of the epistle. <clears throat> he has just cited the words of Habakkuk, and the prophet speaks of faith. <coughs> How then does the prophet's declaration that the righteous man of God will escape death by his faith bear on the apostle's argument or help his strong appeals? The first verse of the 11th chapter is the reply. Faith is the assurance, with emphasis on the verb. This is only a rhetorical connection, or at best, a justification of the, 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 the author has made in the prophet's words. Indeed, he has already in several places identified confidence with faith and the opposite of confidence with unbelief, where he writes, quote, Take heed lest there be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief, for we are become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our confidence firm, the end. <clears throat> And then he also writes, they could not enter into unbelief. Let us therefore give diligence to enter into that rest that no man fall after the same example of disobedience. Be not sluggish, but imitators of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And also having therefore boldness to enter into the holy place, let us draw near with a true heart in fullness of faith. So the book of Hebrews <coughs> is, is, has a foundation for chapter 11. Really referring to various aspects of faith that we need to apply and unbelief that we need to reject and avoid. Why, therefore, does the author formally state that faith is confidence? The difficulty is a real one. We must suppose that when this epistle was written, the word faith was already a well-known and almost technical term among Christians. We must infer as much also from St. James's careful and stringent correction of abuses <clears throat> in the application of the word. It's unnecessary to say who was the first to perceive the vital importance of faith in the life and theology of Christianity. But in the preaching of St. Paul, 
Faith is trust in a personal Savior and trust in the condition and instrument of salvation. Faith represented is the opposite of works. <clears throat> Such a doctrine was liable to, to abuse and has been abused to the utter subversion of morality on the one hand and to the extinction of all unselfish greatness of the soul on the other. Not, most certainly that, Paul, St. Paul himself was the one-sided in teaching or in character. <clears throat> Welcome, Red Room. I didn't see you come in. To him, to Paul, Christ is a heavenly ideal. The Lord is the spirit, and to him, the believer is the spiritual man, whom has the moral intellect of Christ. But it must be confessed, and the history of the church abundantly proves the truth of the news of eternal salvation on the sole condition of trust in Christ is one of the easiest of all true doctrines really abused. <clears throat> the Epistle of St. James and the Epistle to the Hebrews seem to have been written to meet this danger the former represents faith as the inner life of the spirit, the fountain of all active goodness. Faith, if it have not works, wrote James, is dead in itself. Yea, a man will say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith apart from thy works, and I will show by my works, will show thee my faith. <clears throat> St. James contends against the earliest phases of antinomianism. He reconciles faith and morality and maintains that the highest morality springs out of faith. The writer of the epistle to the Hebrews contends against legalism, the proud, self-satisfied, indifferent, hard, slothful, contemptuous, cynical spirit which is quite as truly and often as an abuse of the doctrine of salvation through faith. <clears throat> is the terrible plague of those churches which have never risen above individualism. When men are told that the whole of religion consists in securing the soul's eternal safety, and that this salvation is made sure once for all by a moment's trust in Christ, their afterlife will harden into a worldliness, not gross and sensual, but pitiless and deadening, and they'll put on the garb of religion. <laughs> But the inner life will be eaten by the of cuss and self-righteous pride. These are the men described in the sixth chapter of our epistle, who have, after a fashion, repented and believed, but whose religion has no recuperative power, let alone the growth and richness of deep vitality. <laughs> Our author addresses men whose spiritual life was thus imperiled. Their condition is not that of the heathen world in its agony of despair. He does not call his readers in the words of St. Paul to the jailer at Philippi to trust themselves into the hands of the Lord Jesus that they may be saved. <clears throat> Our 
It too insists on faith. He is anxious to show them that he is not preaching another gospel, but unfolding the meaning of the same conception of faith, which is the central principle of the gospel revealed at the first by Christ to their fathers and applied to the wants of the heathen by the apostle of the Gentiles. <clears throat> If so, it goes without saying that the writer does not intend to give a scholastic definition of faith. The New Testament is not the book in which to seek formal definitions. For his present purpose, we require only to know that whatever else faith includes, confidence and reference <clears throat> to the objects of our hope must find a place in it. Faith bridges over the chasm between hope and the things hoped for. It saves us from building castles in the air or living in a fool's paradise. phantoms of worldliness and the phantoms of religion, for they too exist, will not deceive us. In the course of his discussion in the epistle, the author has used three different words to set forth various sides of the same feeling of confidence. One refers to the freedom and boldness with which the confidence felt manifests its presence in words and actions. <clears throat> Another signifies the fullness of the conviction with, with which the mind, <clears throat> when confident, is saturated. And the third word which we have in the present passage describes confidence as a reality, resting on an unshaken foundation and contrasted with illusions. He has urged Christians to boldness of action <clears throat> and fullness of conviction. Now that he adds that faith is that boldness, that wealth spirits so they rest upon reality and truth. can now, in some measure, estimate the value of the Apostle's description of faith as an assurance con concerning things hoped for, and apply it to give forth to the exhortations of the Epistle. The evil heart of unbelief is the moral corruption of the man whose soul is steeped in sensual imaginations and never realizes, realizes the things of the Spirit. who came out of Egypt by Moses could not enter into rest because they did not descry beyond the earthly Canaan the rest of the Spirit in God. Others inherit the promises because on earth they lifted their hearts to the heavenly country. In short, the apostle now tells his readers that the true source of Christian constancy and boldness is the realization of the unseen world. <clears throat> if faith is this assurance concerning things hoped for because it's a proof of their existence and of the existence of the unseen generally. 
The latter part of the verse is a broad foundation on which faith rests in all the very rich variety of its meanings and practical applications. Here, St. Paul, St. James, and the writer of the epistle to the Hebrews meet in the unity of their conception. <clears throat> Whether men trust unto salvation, or develop their inner spiritual life, or enter into communion with God and lift the weapon of unflinching boldness in Christian warfare, trust, character, confidence, all three derive their being and vitality from faith. And it demonstrates the existence of the unseen. <clears throat> Thanks, Papa One. Glad to see you here tonight. Apostles' language is a seeming contradiction. Proof is usually supposed to dispense with faith and compel us to accept the inference drawn. <clears throat> he intentionally describes faith as occupying in reference to spiritual realities, the place of demonstration. Faith in the unseen is itself proof that the world exists. And it is so in two ways. <clears throat> First, we trust our own moral instincts. Mala Branch observes that our passions justify themselves. How much more is this true of intellect and conscience? In like manner, some men have firm confidence in a world of spiritual realities which I has not seen. This confidence is itself a proof to them. How do I know that I know? It's a philosopher's enigma. <clears throat> For us it may be sufficient to, to know and to know that we know are one and the same act. How do we justify our faith in the unseen? The answer is similar. It's the same thing to trust and to trust our trust. Skepticism wins a cheap victory when, when it arraigns faith as a culprit caught in the very act of stealing the forbidden fruit of paradise. <clears throat> But when, like a guilty thing, faith blushes for its own want of logic, its only refuge is to look in the face of the unseen Father. He who has most faith in his own spiritual instincts will have the strongest faith in God. To trust God is to trust ourselves. Doubt ourselves is to doubt God. We must add that there is innocent that there is a sense in which trust in God means distrust of self. <clears throat> Second, faith fastens directly on God himself. We believe in God because we impose implicit confidence in our own moral nature. With equal truth, we may also say that we believe all else because we believe in God. <clears throat> Faith in God himself immediately and personally is the proof that the promises are true, that our life on earth is linked to a life above, patient well-doing will have its reward, that no good deed can be in vain, and 10,000 other thoughts and hopes that sustain this drooping spirit in hours of conflict. <clears throat> well, 
happen that some of these truths are legitimate inferences from premises, or it may be that a calculation of probabilities is in favor of their truth. But faith trusts itself upon them because they are worthy of God. Sometimes the silence of God is enough if an aspiration of the soul is felt to be such that it became him to implant it and it will be glorious in him to reward the heaven-sent desire. <clears throat> Instance of faith as a proof of the unseen is given by our author in the third verse. We may paraphrase it thus. <clears throat> by faith, we know that the ages have been constructed by the word of God, and that even to this point of assurance, that the visible universe as a whole came not into being out of things that do appear. <clears throat> Author began in the previous verse to unroll his magnificent record of the elders. From the beginning, men found themselves in the presence of a mystery of the past before they received any promise as to the future. And it's the mystery of creation pressed heavily on men in all ages. Apostle himself has felt its power and speaks of it as a question which readers and himself have faced. How do we know that the development of the ages had a beginning? If it had a beginning, how did it begin? The Apostle replies that we know it by faith. <clears throat> Revelations which, which we have received from God addresses itself to our moral perception and our confidence in God's moral nature. We have been taught that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. God said, let there be light. Faith demands this <clears throat> Is faith trust? That trust in God is our proof that the framework of the world was put together by his creative wisdom and power. Is faith the inner life of righteousness? Morality requires that our own consciousness of personality and freedom should be derived from a divine personality as the originator of all things. Is faith communion with God? Those who pray know that prayer is an absolute necessity of their spiritual nature, and prayer lifts its voice to a living Father. Faith demonstrates to him who has it, though not to others, that the universe has come to its present form not by an eternal matter but by the action of God's creative energy. <clears throat> Somewhat peculiar form of the clause seemingly to suggest that the apostle ascribes the origin of the universe not only to a personal creator, but to that personal creator acting through the ideas of his own mind. The visible came into being not out of things that appear. We catch ourselves waiting till he finishes the sentence with the word, but out of things that do not appear. <clears throat> Let 
Most expositors fight shy of the inference and explain it away by alleging that the negative has been misplaced. But it is not true that the but is it not true that the universe is the manifestation of thought in the unity of the divine purpose? This is the very notion required to complete the apostle's statement concerning faith as a proof. If faith demonstrates, it acts on principles. If God is personal, those principles are ideas, thoughts, and purposes of the divine mind. <clears throat> So long, therefore, as our spiritual nature can trust and can unfold a morality, pray. The soul need not much bewail its want of logic and its loss of arguments. If the famous ontological argument for the being of God has been refuted, we shall not on that account tremble for the ark. We shall not lament, though, that the argument from the watch has proven treacherous. Our God is not a mere infinite mechanism. Indeed, <clears throat> such a phrase is a contradiction in terms. A mechanism must be finite. And try as the result produces not what is absolutely best, but what is the best possible under the circumstances and with the materials at his disposal. disposal. But if we have lost the mechanism, we have not lost the God that thinks. We have gained the perfectly righteous and perfectly good. His thoughts have manifested themselves in nature, in human freedom, in the incarnation of his son, in the redemption of sinners. But the intellect that shows these things is the good heart of faith. On in the homiletical. <clears throat> there is much more to review and examine where faith is concerned, and I plan, God willing, to continue this subtopic of faith next week at this same time and place, or place and time. And I invite all of you who are reading or hearing my words to join us next time. For those of you who were pretty sure I was just about to say it, and you would be correct, this concludes this evening's discussion. What is a Christian? Part 26. Now, Butler, before I get to your question, and I will, we're not quite done. Violinist, would you please favor us, brother, with a piece or two on your violin? The floor is yours. <laughs> Hey, Abby, be a good girl. Here she's on a bench. It's okay, now he's here. Yeah. He's on the bench. It's okay, now he's here. Ready? It's okay. It's okay. Good girl. 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 Good girl.
Good girl. Thank <laughs> you. 